theyeshiva.net. going to give a brief uh, historical introduction to the story that we're going to explore this morning in Gemara and Meseches Gitten. The year was 66 after the Common Era, or in the Hebrew calendar it would be uh, 3,000 uh, Gimel Tuf Tuf Chavav, which means uh, 3,826 since creation, 3826 since creation. And the Jews of Judea, of Yehuda, rebelled against their brutal Roman masters. In response, the Roman Emperor Nero, or as he's known in our sources as Nero in Caesar, the Caesar Nero dispatched an army under the leadership of General Vespasian, who's known by us as Aspasianus, to restore order and crush the Jewish revolt. By the year 68, resistance in the northern part of the province had been eradicated, so the Romans turned their full attention to the subjugation of Judea and Jerusalem. The same year, Emperor Nero disappeared. According to Roman history, he died by his own hand, he committed suicide. According to Jewish sources, he converted to Judaism. This created a power vacuum in Rome. In the resulting chaos, Vespasian, who was leading the revolt, was declared emperor, and he returned to the imperial city of Rome. His son, Titus, or Titus, led the remaining army in the assault on Jerusalem. The Roman legion surrounded the city, and they began to slowly squeeze out the life of the Jewish stronghold. By the year 70, the attackers breached the walls of Jerusalem and they began a systematic ransacking of the city. And the destruction culminated in the burning and the destruction of the Beis Amikdash on the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, on Tisha B'av, of that year 70, Gimel Alafim Tav Tav Lamed, 3,830 since creation. The fighting was fierce, brutal, bloody, vicious, and horrible. In victory, the Romans slaughtered hundreds of thousands, some put the number at a million or more. Hundreds of thousands of those who were spared from death were sold into slavery. Many of them were enslaved and sent to toil in the mines of Egypt. Others were sold as, slave, as slaves all over the Roman Empire. The price of a Jew was cheaper than the price of a horse. Others were dispersed to arenas along the empire to be butchered for the amusement of the public. All the sacred vessels and relics of the Beis Amikdash were taken to Rome, and they were, there they were displayed as a celebration of victory. The rebellion continued for a few years, and finally was crushed in the year 73, Three years later, with the fall of all the pockets of Jewish resistance, including Masada and other pockets of resistance, and thus came to an end that Jewish revolt against Rome, which lasted for all of these years, from 66 till 73, for seven years. It was a very, very powerful resistance, and Rome crushed it with its full, ferocious might, which of course culminates in the event of the three weeks, the events of the three weeks in Tisha B'av of that year. Shivasa Batamas, they breached the walls, and Tisha B'av, they managed to destroy and burn the Beis Hamikdash. 
I should say others make put the years a little different. Some say the Churban was 68, 69, or 70. When the Gemara wants to focus our attention to what provoked the horror, it shares one narrative. In Masech the Gitten, Dafnun Hei and Dafnun Vav, the Gemara famously declares, Akamtsu bar Kamtsu Chor of Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim was destroyed because of the story of Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa, which is, of course, the Jewish way of expressing the truth that even though there were many events that led to the destruction of Yerushalayim, the greatest event was the fact that Rome and the Jewish people were butting heads. Their oppression was impossible. The Jews themselves were fighting what the response should be. There were the zealots who felt that out war, war against Rome is the path to go. There were most of the sages, like Rabbi Eichin and Ben Zaka, who felt that was not the way to go. Compromise was needed under the circumstances based on the power of Rome. And as a result of so many factors and events, it led to this absolute disaster and har horrible massacre and what almost seemed to become the end of the Jewish people and certainly the end of the Jewish commonwealth and Jewish sovereignty and the end of Jerusalem and the Beis HaMikdash. But there are always the small events that seem insignificant and inconsequential, but they're not insignificant. And our sages often try to point out these what seem like insignificant events to explain how significant and valuable they are in the scheme of things. And so today we're going to explore one of these. Within the story of Kamtsa Bar Kamtsa itself, it's an event, a detail within what would seem a small story, but this is a small story within the small story that they turned into something quite grander and extraordinary. So if you look in your first source, in your first source, in your source sheets, this is the second half of the story of Kamtsa Bar Kamtsa and Gitten, Tractate Gitten 56a Nun Vavamet Aleph. The first half of the story is well known. There was a Jew who threw a party, a feast in Yerushalayim. He had a friend named Kamtsa and a sworn en enemy named Bar Kamtsa. He sends his servant to invite his best friend to the party, Kamtsa. Instead, the man invites his enemy to the party, Bar Kamtsa. Why he did that? Room for speculation. The owner, the Balabayas, the host, sees his grand enemy at the party and he asks him to leave. He publicly says, leave. The man doesn't want to leave. He offers to pay for his meal so that he will cover his own expenses. The man says, leave. He offers to pay for half the meal. The man refuses to accept the money. Leave my home. He offers to pay for the entire party out of his own pocket if he allows him to stay. Now, I know what I would do under such circumstances. If you're making a wedding threw eighty thousand dollars into the wedding your sworn enemy comes and offers to pay for the whole wedding i think it's a wonderful opportunity not only not only don't you have to pay you also had your enemy lose eighty thousand bucks i don't know what's so bad about that opportunity but this guy must have been very idealistic so we must assume so he refuses to take even a penny or ruble <laughs> to uh let him stay and instead, as the Gemara says, and here you see it, He grabs him with his hand, he stands him up, he brings him up, and he takes him out, he literally schleps him out of the party. Omar, this man, Bar Kamtsa, says, The rabbis were sitting at this feast, and they did not protest this public display of embarrassment and shame. Doesn't this prove that they're fine with this? They acquiesce to this behavior. They embrace this behavior. They sanction it. Ezel Eichel Bukurtze Beimalka. I am going to inform upon them to the emperor. Omalele Kaiser. He comes to the Caesar and he tells the Kaiser. Kaiser is the Hebrew word for Caesar. Just like in Russian you have the Tsar. It all comes from the word Kaiser. Kaiser, Caesar, Tsar, Tsar. Omar lay, oh, so he tells the case of uh, the Jews rebelled against you. Omar lay, the Caesar tells him, Mi Who says this? 
Amale Bar Kamtsa says, Shadar Luhu Kurbana, Chazisimikarvin Le. Send a sacrifice, send a carbon. And the fact is, halachically, non Jews could offer offerings, karbanas, just as Jews could. And they're accepted, and they're offered in the base of Mikdash. Send a sacrifice and see if they offer it. If they offer it, obviously, they're on good terms with you. If they reject it, it means that they are, uh, they have rejected you. Azal, Shadar Biyade, Iglatilsa. The king, the Caesar, sent with Barkamsa. Iglatilsa means third calf of the family, in the family of cows, of calves. In other words, the best, the choicest calf. Bahadi de Kaasi, as he's coming to Jerusalem, Shadi Be Mumma Benifs Fasayim. Barkamsa places a blemish in the upper lip of this calf. Ba'amrile Bedukin Shabayim. And others say in the apple of the eye. He made sure that the blemish would be such that from the Gentiles' vantage point, it's not called a blemish. They would always offer such an animal on their own altars. But in halacha, in Jewish law, for us, it's a blemish that delegitimizes, doesn't allow the animal to be offered on the altar. In other words, if it would have been an obvious, blatant, explicit blemish, the reasons would be clear, but he did such a type of mum that they would never consider it a blemish in their own eyes. We'll soon see the way this story is recorded in the Medrash, Rabbi and Eicha. There is a very important detail here that qualifies and explains more of this detail of the story. The calf comes, it's brought from the Caesar. The rabbis believe that I have to offer it on the Mizbeach in the Beis HaMikdash because of Shalom Malchus, to remain at peace with the empire, despite the fact that halachically it would be forbidden. There would be a mitzvah loisasa, a negative prohibition in Parshish Emmer, that a mum, a blemished animal, may not be offered on the altar. But this is a different situation. Shloy Malchus. Om Maluhu Reb Ben Afkilis. There is a Tana, a sage, he's called Rabbi. He's a great sage at the time. Obviously, this is the last period of the second base Amikdash. That means the first century after the common era, as mentioned. He says, Yoimru, Bali Mumen Kreven Lagabe Mizbeach. They might say and deduce from this incident that you can offer blemished animals on the altar. Savur le Miktale, the Lalezel Velema. So the rabbis thought, okay, we have no choice. We have to kill him. If we don't kill this man, he's going to go back and tell the king that we rebelled against the empire. In other words, they are defining him in halacha as somebody who's called a roidif. A roidif means somebody who is actively pursuing the life of an innocent person. Certainly here, not the life of one person. Every Jew living in the Holy Land and beyond, Jerusalem, the future of the Jewish people, he's an informer. He is coming to the emperor and saying, they rebelled against you. Eradicate Jerusalem. Destroy Judea. All right, if you could kill. Amaluhu Rebschariah, Rebschariah, the son of Afkila, is the same Rebschariah says, They're going to say, somebody who casts, who places a blemish in a holy animal, has to be killed. There's no such a thing. It's a sin. You're not allowed to offer it. But there's no death penalty for blemishing a carbon. If you kill him, people might say he gets the death penalty. This is wrong. And therefore, what happens, of course? They don't do anything. They don't sacrifice the animal on the altar because Abchayib and Afkila said, Yoimru, they're going to say, Bali Mum Kraven, you're allowed to offer a blemished animal. They don't kill him because you don't get the death penalty for blemishing a calf, even though it's the wrong thing to do. So nothing is done. Passivity was the answer. So what happens, of course? Naturally, he proves to the king that the calf was not offered. It was not sacrificed. The Jews reject him. The Jews loathe him. The Jews despise him. This is a dangerous region. And the subsequent events follow. Omar Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan, who lives two generations later, Yochanan is the first generation of Amirayim, the editor of Talmud Yerushalmi, 
living in Eretz Yisrael, says Reb Yochanan, an vasnusoy shor Reb Scharia ben Afkilas, hechrives beisenu, v'sarfes hechaleinu v'iglisano me'artzenu. An vasnusoy, which literally means the humility, the anova, ha'ish moisha anov, the humility, the anova, of Scharia, Reb Scharia ben Afkilas, destroyed our home, burnt our temple, and exiled us from our land. Words of Rabbi Yochanan. Now these are fascinating words of Rabbi Yochanan. He knew very well what destroyed our Beis HaMikdash. It was Roman brutality and oppression. It was the fact that the Jews could not coexist with the Romans. It was that the Jews themselves were split. It, that this man went and informed to the Jews on the Roman, to the Roman Caesar on the Jews. Reb Schayyeb and Afkilas was caught, as they say, between the rock and the hardball, trying to figure out what's the right decision. But Reb Yochanan ben Zakkai almost puts the Reb Yochanan, Reb Yochanan, sorry, puts the onus on him and says his anova hechriva es beisein. What is? The meaning of the word anvasnusoy, his humility. Where do we see here a display of humility? What did he mean, anvasnusoy, the humility of Scharia ben Afkilas? Where is the anova, the humility in this story? This story has been analyzed throughout the generations, of course, as every story in Gemara, and many different perspectives emerged. And today I want to explore four or five of these perspectives completely from different angles. We'll see one perspective, you know, in Torah there's always pardes, pshat, remes, drush, soit, the literal interpretation, and intimations, hints, and homiletics, and deeper, deeper wisdom, esoteric ideas, etc. We'll explore one perspective from the world of remes, a perspective from the world of drush, Perspective from the world of Pshat, from the world of history, from the world of Sod. Let's begin a Sefer, known as Sefer Hagan Vederich Moshe. Masha Shamati mi Piagon, Hagodom Mireno Ravre Bavrom, Brude Nere Eden, Shoyre Shishiva de Kihil Kadisha Prague. He's quoting a man named Rebavrom, Rosh Shiva in Prague. Amadi Isse Kolamizgo, maybe Chemala Oilam. Is a source of our sages, someone who's arrogant brings wrath to the world. What's the connection? Quit per quo. You're arrogant, you bring wrath. So he says, This is the Gemara de Saita. The Gemara says, In Mesech Saita, Daf Hei, Amarav, Talmud Chachem, Tzerech, Shiyei, Boyechad, Mishmini, Shabashminis. Rav said, Talmud Chachem, Otaris Kala has to have a little arrogance, an eighth of an eighth. Shmini Shabashminis of Gaiva, a little, little arrogance he has to have. Amir Ibn Nachim by Yitzchak, Loy Minovalay Mikzos, and not true, nothing. The Ksiv, the Possek says in Mishle, Tayavas Hashem called Gvalev. It's an abomination of God, someone who's arrogant. Loy Minovalay Mikzos, and nothing. Rav says a little bit Shmini Shabashminis, which means, what's a Shmini Shabashminis? An eighth of an eighth, 64th part of arrogance. Yeah, take arrogance, split it up into 64 pieces. And let him take one, one sixty-fourth part of it. That's called a shmini shibishminis. The marsha says, why does he give this number? Because samach gimel, if he would take a sixty-third, it would be gas. Samach gimel is gas, arrogance. So samach dalit, take a sixty-fourth of it. But Reb Nachim by Yitzchak says nothing, absolutely nothing. O Pesho, a mefarshim, so the mefarshim explain the pluktayu who befidush tevas koil. They're arguing in the meaning of the posik. In Mishlei Tezayin, Proverbs 16, Toyavas Hashem Kol Gvalev. It's the abomination of God, Kol. What does Kol Gvalev mean? Rav Savar Kol Gvalev, Loshen Kuloi, Kuloi Mar Kuloi Yasser, Ravel Miktas Mutter. Vereb Nachem by Yitzchak Mefarish, Kol Afilu Kol Duhu Yasser. Toyavas Hashem Kol Gvalev, Rav says, it's disgusting for Hashem, Kol Gvalev. If the person is entirely arrogant, if all of him, kuloi, kol, from the word kuloi, all of him is gvalev. But a little bit of arrogance, a little bit of pride, is nishka ferlach, on the contrary, it's necessary. Reb Nachem says, kol, from the word of any, 
Tayavas Hashem call not all of him is Gvalev. Call Gvalev any Gvalev. Call Chamira Vachamia the Ikebir Shusi. We say Erev Pesach. Any Chomets. Not call all the Chomets. It means also all. It can mean both. Call Chamira Vachamia all. Call also any. Any Gvalev. Any vestige. Any little tiny fraction of arrogance is forbidden. If this is the case, when it says kol, they have this argument. So wherever you have in Tanakh the word kol, you can have the same argument. Does it mean all or does it mean any? So when it says, He will not arouse all of his wrath. What does kol mean? You could mean all or any. V'yuvan kolam is ga, v'yuvan kolam is ga, and when he say kolam is ga, v'him kein mefarish kol gvalev davka kuloi aser avol mikzas muter. So Reb Nachum, so therefore, when you say kol gvalev, does it mean none or it means all? Not, but a little bit, yeah. V'hu adin mefarish v'loyoyer kol chamosay shadavka kol hachem v'loyoyer avol mikzas yoyer chas v'shalom. So he says, therefore, the Chazal say, Kol HaMizgah, Mevi Chema La'olam. Why? Because, V'layoyir Kol Chamosoy. According to this interpretation of Reb Nachem by Yitzchak, that you're not allowed to have any arrogance. Because Kol Gvalev means nothing, no Gvalev. V'layoyir Kol Chamosoy. L'yoyir Kol Chamosoy means none of Chamosoy. According to the first interpretation, kol gvalev means it could be a little gvalev. So that's why kol chamasai also means there could be a little chema. So that's what his response to Rav is. According to you, who says that Tamad Chachem Tzarek Shiei Bay Echad Meshmenesh Meshmenes, Tamad Chachem could have a little arrogance because Tayavas Hashem kol gvalev means what? A little bit, yes. So when it says v'loyoy kol chamasai, it means he shouldn't get angry completely. But a little bit angry? Yes. So by you saying that somebody is entitled to have a little arrogance because you explained that kol doesn't mean nothing. Kol means a little bit. So layar kol chamasay means he won't give us all of his anger, but a little bit, yeah. So kol is gone, maybe chem By being arrogant and relying on this interpretation of kol, kol means not to have a whole wave of arrogance, but a little bit, yeah, you're bringing Chema, you're bringing ire to the world. Why? Because layar kol chamase doesn't mean layar kol chamase any of his anger. It means all of his anger, but a little, little bit of anger could come. Kol amizga may be chema loylam. This is his interpretation. O bazen navi gemar navin gemar de gitten. Amar Rabbi Yechon am vasnusi shos chayy ben avkilas echriva es beseinu v'kasha ma'ua lashon am vasnusi hay lelem and hayra asoi she pasuk reb chayy shle la akriva sa carbon shla kesher echriva es beseinu. What's the meaning of the word anvasnusay? The word should be hoira asay. The instruction of Zechariah ben Afkilas destroyed our home. Ella de pluktuhu be pasik. We have a pasik in Emmer. Koil asher boy mum loy sakrivu. Any animal that has a blemish, don't offer. Chad amar mum mamish davkadainu mechusar ever. Vechad amar afilu kolduhu. One view is kol mum means a real blemish, it's missing a limb. One says kol mum means any slight blemish already delegitimizes the animal. Vim kein mefadish, the kol mum lo sakrivu nami kol du mash magam kein lo yakriv. For lechein lo yotze lo hakriv, vehechriv es peisenu vekalav. When it says kol mum, kol asher boy mum lo sakrivu, it could mean kol asher boy mum. If it has a whole mum, if it has a mum that is really a mum mamish, it's a full mum, it's missing a limb, then don't offer it. But if it's a tiny little mum, you could offer it. Or you could say, Koil HaShabai Mum, any mum, anything loy sakrivu, you shouldn't offer. So therefore, if you say, Koil HaShabai Mum loy sakrivu means nothing, you also hold, Toyavas HaShem Kol Gvalev means nothing. In other words, absolute humility. So Koil means absolutely nothing, not even the slightest arrogance. Pschaya ben Afkilas, who holds that even the tiny blemish cannot be offered, like this blemish, he holds that kol means nothing, not even a bit. In other words, his humility was the highest level of humility, because that's his interpretation in Toyavas Hashem Kol Gvalev. So, an vasnusoy shoschaya ben Afkilas. 
It's his interpretation about humility. That koil means not even the slightest gvalev that ultimately causes him to, causes him to explain koil asher by mum lois hakrivu any mum and therefore hakrivu as beiseinu. This is what you call a remez or a drush in explaining the Gemara. The Chida in the Sefer Reish David Vayigash brings this interpretation in the name of Rabboni Ashkenaz German rabbis. Let's see the Vilna Gaon's interpretation. Very interesting and completely different interpretation. Al Pima Sheshaninu B'Mesechtes Anedun Lamed Beis Dinei Nefoshes Maschilin Min Atzad Uberashi Min Atzad Min Aktanim Shema Yechayvenu HaGodol V'Lo Yitzulach Lek Al Dvarav Mishum Lo Yisana Al Riv Al Dvarav Shal Godol Rav Ksiv B'Lo Yud There's a Mishnah in Sanhedrin Daf Lamed Beis Omud Aleph Sanhedrin 32a it speaks about when a court convenes to deal with capital trials. You always count the votes from the smaller ones, meaning from the sages who are younger or less prominent in the Sanhedrin. Why? If you start the vote with the greater sages once the younger ones or the smaller ones see how they voted, they're going to be afraid or they're going to feel that they cannot express their own opinion and they're going to acquiesce to that opinion. The Pasuk says, Loisana al riv lintois in Parshas Mishpata. So the Gemara in Sanhedrin Lamidvav says, Loisana riv is without a yud. So you could read it, Loisana al rav. Don't respond to the rav, to the great one. So the younger one of the Sanhedrin feels, how can I argue with the Rav, with the great one? So he's going to be silenced. Really, he needs to say his opinion. It's his opinion. That's what he believes is the truth. This is justice. But he's going to be intimidated or he's going to feel it's the right thing. Loisana, how can he argue? So therefore, maschilin min atzad. You always start to vote with the smaller ones. Go from younger or smaller to older and greater. And that's how you do the vote, so you don't know what his opinion is, what the Nasi's opinion is, what the Avbezdin's opinion is, and it won't manipulate, it won't cause you to curtail your view, your perspective. The Gemara gives another interpretation on Lamed Vav. We learned from, from uh, David HaMelech, there's a Pasuk that David HaMelech first had his servants make the verdict, and then himself for the same reason. They wanted to kill him because somebody who comes to kill you first, somebody who comes to kill you, kill him first. And this man was not innocent. He was trying to kill the Jews. He went to the king. But his verdict prevailed. Why did they listen to Reb Scharia? There was another view. It says clearly, the Gemara says that the rabbis first wanted to offer it, and then the rabbis, it says, the rabbis, the sages, wanted to offer the animal, and then they wanted to kill him. So there was an argument here. Reb Scharia said no, they said yes. Why did they all listen to him? The answer is, he must have been, says the Vilna God, the greatest of all of them. And they didn't want to argue with him. They felt that it, that's their responsibility to surrender their opinion to his opinion. And therefore they embraced his view. But then we have a question. Why was his opinion said first? Dine nefashis, you start first. From the smaller ones. Ask the Vilna Gaon a simple question. How did this work? There's a system in Halacha. You follow the majority. I don't care if the greatest of the Sanhedrin says you do this. If the majority is against him, you follow the majority. You follow the majority. So how did this happen here? If he was the Gadol, and that's why they embraced him, that means his view came last. Because So that means you had to start with the other ones. By the time you came to him, and you don't know what he thinks yet, 
it would have been obvious that the majority holds that you should kill Bar Kamtsa. If the majority holds you should kill Bar Kamtsa, they had to tell him, Nebzcharya, you're outvoted and we have to kill him. This means that what happened, he said his opinion first. And because he said his opinion first, therefore when they started to vote, everyone agreed with him. Why? Because they felt internally they can't disagree with him. So now when they were counting the votes, the majority was like, because he said his opinion first. So here's a question. He said his opinion first. They all felt they have to agree with him because he's the Godel. If he's the Godel, he should have said his opinion last according to halacha. That's the Vilna Gaon's question. How did this work? There had to be a vote. The majority or not? So you're saying it wasn't the majority, it was just him. So how did they follow him? Because everybody agreed with him because of internal pressure that they have to agree with him. In other words, he spoke first. He should have spoken last. If he would have spoken last, everything would have been good because they would have seen that the majority is against him. No, now you understand the Gemara. An Vosnu Seshel Scharya. So the answer is... Ela Shereb Scharya Mirei Van Vosnu Seshel Scharya Hechzik Atzmi Kiktanem Shebeneyem. Because he was so humble, so therefore he considered himself as the cotton of the Sanhedrin. One of the smallest ones. V'lochein higit des daite b'rishoyna. He was really humble. So he right away said his opinion first. Umirei Van Vosnu Seshel Choshev L'Atzmai Sha'ochein Maschilin Min Atzad K'Shayavia Miyad Des Daite. He thought when he says his opinion, that is called Maschilin Min Atzad. You start with the smallest. So he jumped up. He said, hey, this is what I say. Or number one and number two, number three, but in the beginning. Once he spoke, their mouths were shut. I can't argue. So ultimately, the Churban happens. It's the humility of Schaya ben Afkilas. The humility of him speaking up first because he really considered himself to be a cotton, and therefore he speaks first, not the godl of the Sanhedrin. This is the view of the Vilna Gaon. I saw it also in other Svarim brought in the names of some other sources. That's a good question. You're saying the order of the Yomar is Savur Rabbanon, Likruvi Mishim Shalom Malchus, and then he argued. And then it's a Savur Lemiktele, right? They decided that they should kill him, but he argued. But the truth is, if you look into the Gemara, it actually fits very well. The Gemara doesn't say that they said you should kill him. The Gemara says Savur. Savur. What does Svara mean? They thought. They thought. It actually fits very interestingly. It fits very well. They thought. They really held you have to kill him. But he spoke up first. And he said, how could you kill such a person? Now, maybe one or two said it. It's possible. Minatsa doesn't mean necessarily he was the first. Maybe he was one, he was two, he was three. But there was still plenty of Dayanim to be persuaded by his position and say, he must be right. Who's going to argue with Reb Shaya, the God Lador? The man knows much more. I'm going to sit and argue with him. I'm not arguing. You know, they, they surrender their mind because Loisan Araf. So, Savur, really, if he would have spoken last, you would see that the majority says, kill the man. He's a Roidif. But since he spoke up, in the beginning, or early on, or first. So therefore, their svara never came out. That's how I would uh, answer your question. But let's now take this to the next step. If you could turn to your page two, to the second page of your sources, How many times is Reb Scharia ben Afkilis mentioned in our sources? In Mishnayis, in Gemara, in Bavli, Yerushalmi, Medrash. And the answer is, this time, and once more. Once more. Which is also very interesting. If he is considered the greatest of the great, we know one more thing about him. One more statement that he makes when it comes to the laws of Shabbos. Take a look at a Toisefta, Mesechta Shabbos, Perik Yud Zion, Dalad. Toisefta, of course, is a Brysa. The Brysa, which is a combination of two words, Bar Yesa, Brysa, which means 
brought in from outside. Bar means outside. Yesa means brought in. Because when the Mishnah was authored by its editor, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, and his colleagues, there were many texts that he did not enter, that he did not insert into the Mishnah. So there was a parallel Mishnah, parallel text, that was authored by some of the students of Rebbe and his colleagues, known as Brisa, which elucidates and explains many of the ideas in the Mishnah. Sometimes there's many contradictions. And much of Talmud Bavli is the attempt to reconcile between Mishnahs and Brisa's, Vahatnan, Vahatanya, or elucidate Mishnahs through Brisa's, which was a parallel text that elucidates many Mishnahs, or clarifies or brings up new problems and new dilemmas. Says the Toisefta, a little intro to understand this Toisefta. We know that our sages introduced in the laws of Shabbos a concept of mukta. The word mukta means set aside, segregated, set apart. What is the definition of mukta? It's not a biblical, in most situations, it's not a biblical violation. It's a rabbinic violation. And what that is, that before Shabbos, a person makes, so to speak, hypothetically, a person makes a mental inventory of items that are usable on Shabbos and items that you have no use for them on Shabbos. Items that are usable on Shabbos, you can move around. Items that you have no use for them on Shabbos, you can touch, but you can't move them. So, for example, a hammer, a screwdriver, a drill, a brick, a laptop, an iPhone. These are things that the Jew doesn't have use for them on Shabbos. Raw flour, raw pasta, raw potato, raw beans. These are raw foods. What are you going to do with them on Shabbos? What are you doing with raw potatoes or raw flour on Shabbos? You have to knead them. You have to bake them. Kneading is forbidden. Baking is forbidden. So raw flour becomes muktza. Raw pasta becomes muktza. A hammer becomes muktza. A brick becomes muktza. What are you doing? Construction on Shabbos. These are muktza. A book. You have use on Shabbos. A bowl, a plate, a table, a fork, a knife, a couch, a chair, a bookcase etc. A pillow, a blanket, a coat, a shirt, pants, a hat. These are things that you have used for them on Shabbos. You use them on Shabbos. They're not mukt. Says the Toisefet. Beis Hillel Oymrim Beis Hillel says Magbiyin me'ala shulchan atzomay suklipin. At the end of a meal you have on the table bones and shells, husks. They're not edible. If they're edible like crumbs, little crumbs of bread, it's edible. So if it's edible, it's food. All food that's edible is not muktza. Bread is not muktza, of course. Salad is not muktza. All foods are not muktza. But the bones and the shells, if you have an animal who's going to eat them, that means edible, it's not muktza. But we're talking about bones and shells if you have no animals there. Or they're not edible even for animals. It's not like banana peels and you have monkeys around, like in Umschlange in South Africa. When I was in a hotel over there, some monkeys come in and they just eat your food. So then nothing is mukta. But uh, in this situation where you're not going to have exactly these animals eating the bones or the shells, even if you have animals around, Basilo says you might think you can't touch them after the meal. You could lift them up and put them in the garbage. says, menara. Instead of actually taking the bones with your hand or with a knife, you should actually lift up. The whole tavla, the whole board, what we would call the tablecloth, and shake it off with all the bones into the garbage. That's the argument between Beishamai and Beishil. I should note that in Mesech the Shabbos and Mesech the Beits in the beginning, this argument is brought reversed. Beishil is the stringent one and Beishamai is the lenient one, but the Gemara brings over there from Reb Nachman that you have to reverse it like we have it here. Beishil is lenient, Beishamai is stringent. Scharia ben Afkilis. Schaya, the son of Achilles, did not practice, not like Beisham and not like Beisilom. What he would do is, while he was eating, when he got to the peel or he got to the bone, he spit it out with his tongue. He spit it out behind the couch where he was sitting. He didn't want to do it in front of the couch, it wouldn't be nice. People were sitting. But he would turn around, everyone had a little bed. Everybody would sit on a little bed, like a little couch. That's how they would sit and eat. So Neutel, he would take it while it's in his mouth. That's what the Mepharshim explained. And with his tongue, he would spit it out behind the couch. So in other words, not only would he not do like Basila, who says you can actually lift them up and throw them out, even like Beishama, who says don't touch them, but pick up the whole table or pick up the whole tablecloth or pick up the whole tablet, the whole bretel, the, the board, and throw it out. He wouldn't do that either. 
Instead, he would spit it out from his mouth while he was eating, so he had no contact with it ever. Because as he was eating it, he got rid of it, and he didn't have to deal with it till after Shabbos. I guess after Shabbos, he could sweep up the floor. Okay, this seems like a legitimate three-way machloikas that the whole Shas is busy with. Beis is stringent, Beis Hillel is lenient, and Epschari ben Afkilis is really stringent. Beis doesn't work for him, Beis Hillel doesn't work for him. The response to this is mind-staggering. Amr Reb Yossi, Reb Yossi says, An vasnusa shal Reb Shchayi ben Afkilas, sarfe es ha'echel. The humility of Shchayi ben Afkilas burnt down the Beis HaMikdash. He didn't want to touch bones and husks on Shabbos. That's responsible for Shreifas Beis HaMikdash. It's like, whoa, whoa. You can argue with him. Say, Reb Shchayi, you're being machmer, you're wrong. Beis Shama is right, Beis Hillel is right. What are you doing? The whole Shas is filled with that. But this type of response of Rabbi Yossi, poor Rabbi Shaya ben Afkilis, Rabbi Yochanan blamed him for the Churban Beis HaMikdash. Rabbi Yossi blamed him. But Rabbi Yochanan at least is talking about an event that happened right there. He didn't want to offer the king's animal. He didn't want to kill the Reutif, the murderer, the pursuer. Here, he didn't want to pick up a bone on Shabbos. He didn't want to lift up a tablecloth that had muktzah on it on Shabbos, that had food that's un- not edible. And Rabbi Yossi says, this is responsible for Churban Beis HaMikdash. In fact, the Gemara in Shabbos Kuf Mem Gimel says, Here you see the interpretation of the Tesefta. He would turn his face around behind his couch and throw out these shells and husks that would remain not edible on Shabbos. How do we understand this? How do we make sense of this? A whole other dimension of Shariah ben Afkilis. So let's see Achsam Soifer. Another dimension in all of this. Achsam Soifer, Mesech Tegit, and Afnun Vavam and Aleph. Zog de Achsam Soifer. It's a little bit winding, but you see all of the commentaries here are somewhat winding because it's a difficult, it's difficult to, uh, to, uh, to fathom this, to understand this. Yes, the second source sheet, the third source from the top. The second source sheet, the, the third source from the top, it says, Chsam Soifer Gitin Nun Vav Aleph. You see? Chsam Soifer was written by Reb Moshe Soifer, Reb Moshe Schreiber, who was, of course, the chief rabbi of Presburg, which was then part of the Austria Hungarian Empire. And uh, the whole empire was dissolved during the First World War in 1914, 100 years ago a little more than 100 years ago, but so Preshburg today is known as Bratislava. That's the city where the Chsam Soifer lived and where he practiced, and he was really one of the leading figures of uh, Hungarian and Austrian jury, not only himself, but in terms of the students and disciples that the Chsam Soifer created. He wrote a commentary on Shas, and this is what he wrote. The Chsam Soifer passed away, I think, in the year Tough Rage, 1840. Zog the Chsam this is in Gitin, in the Gemara here with the Churban. He quotes it. And by the way, the verdict in Shulchan Aruch is like Beishamai, that we don't pick up the bones and the shells unless they're edible. We take the plastic or the tablecloth or the board and we shake it off into the garbage. Because there's a machloik of Beishamai and Besillel, how serious we take muktza. According to Beis Hillel, it's the shit of Reb Shimon, who was very lenient with Muktza. Beis Shammai is the shit of Reb Yehuda, who was very stringent with Muktza. And we follow usually the shit that is more, it depends on the situation, but often we follow the shit that is stringent with Muktza, and therefore we, do, we shake off the board. So the B'chsam Soifer, V'reb Shchaya ben Afkilis, L'ha Yosel Loike B'shamay V'loike B'shillel, L'noite Chumash L'cha Achri Amita, Omri Reb Yosi, Amvas Nusr, Reb Shchaya ben Afkilis, Sarfa Hechel. V'hu Tamua. And this is very absurd, very strange. Gam lefadish pirish rashi an vasnusoi savlonusoi. There's something else that some Seifer wants to address. Rashi and Gitin, on the words, the humility of the Pschariya, destroy the Beis Hamikdash, Rashi says an vasnusoi is savlonusoi. Savlanut means patience. To be soivel, to... Uh, soivel to... Uh, what? Tolerating, extremely tolerating. What was Rabbi Yoich, Rabbi Shaya tolerant of? Rashi says he didn't kill him. 
He refused to kill him. So Rashi right away changes on Vasnusai to Savlonusai. He explains on Vasnusai in terms of Savlonusai. Not humility, but patience. Savlonus. Says the Chsam Soif, Nidil Ani is Daiti. Hoda Omer Ebschari Yemru Matul Mumbekotchem Chayiv Misa Yemru Mali Mumkarv Lagabi Mizbeach. Why was he so afraid that people will say, you can offer a blemished animal? Or you, you get a death penalty for making a blemish. His chash was the chilul Hashem, the desecration of Hashem. What does this mean? Everybody, what's the chilul Hashem? Or in other words, if some soifer is saying, you'll tell everybody what happened. What's the problem? Everyone is going to say, oh, we offered a blemished animal. No, we don't offer a blemished animal. This happened to be from the Caesar. When you'll be the Caesar, we'll also offer your behemoth. In the meantime, you're not the case. So Yechaim Yankel. Yechaim Yankel from Bnei Brak. We're not going to offer you a blemished animal. I mean, it's such a complicated story. They kill him. We're going to start killing? No, not everybody who makes a blemish do we kill. This guy made a blemish in the Roman emperor's animal. It's the superpower of the time. He was trying to destroy the people. We had no choice. So what's bothering them? So Chassam Soifer says, it's a chilul Hashem, what? The whole world knows that we don't offer blemished animals. The whole world also knows that we don't kill people who make blemishes and carbonas. It's not that Jewish history started right then. The Beis HaMikdash has been around for 400 years. The first Beis HaMikdash has been around for another 400 years. Altogether, 830 years. This one 410, this one 420. Hundreds of years, Jews don't offer blemished animals. Hundreds of years, Jews don't kill people who made a blemish in an animal. So suddenly they're going to think this one event reversed a millennia of Jewish history. Really, more than a millennia, already back to the Mishkan. Ella, al yedeze yisu v'yitnu mazarez belevona b'shoyrej v'yisoy das chalas hamais. Mazarez belevona means the yentus and shtetl. I'm going to start, all the yachnas are going to start talking about this. Killing somebody, you're not doing it somewhere in a dark alley in a cellar in uh, Stalin's gulags. This is being done by the Beis Hamikdash. Somebody's going to find out about this. This is a public story here. The king sent him. So right away, no one is going to say that you could make a mum in a carbon, or you should kill everybody who makes a mum. But they're going to start discussing the shoyrish v'yisoyid as What happened here? How did this happen? Basically, this guy was guilty because he wanted to surrender the Jewish people to the Malchus, to the, to the Roman regime. So now they're going to ask, How does a Jew come to do this? Where did this grow from? And the answer is going to be, Ah, he was at a party. And they threw him out. And the rabbis were sitting. And nobody protested. And all of the Jewish people, the Hadyotim, the simple Jews, will forever look at the Chachmi Yisrael, at the leaders, in a very, very derogatory way. Their reputation will be desecrated forever. That this is how they can behave at a party. Somebody was publicly thrown out, publicly ashamed, publicly rejected. Nobody stood up to say a word, how do you embarrass somebody in public? And everyone will know this because they're going to find out why this came about and they're going to go back to that story. That's what was bothering the Pschaya. It wasn't just what he said, this incident. They're going to say, you make a blemish in an animal. He means the next step. It's a domino effect. They're going to say, you make a blemish in an animal. You don't make a blemish in an animal. So why'd they offer this animal? You're not allowed to offer a blemished animal. Or if you kill him, or you don't kill such a person. So why'd they kill him? So they're going to analyze the story and go back to the original story and they go back. The result is going to be, this is how rabbis behave. This is how Chachmi Yisrael, this is how the Jewish leaders, the Jewish sages behave. And this could be a catastrophic, can have a catastrophic results. Amnam, says the Chsam Saif. Mi sheyesh loy moyach bekot kodoy. Yedei nevasot hakop, anybody who has a brain in his skull, literally understands 
So it's one second. You wanted that the Chachamim should do what? They should protest. They should attack the host. They should say, no, he's staying here. But anyone who has a brain, says the Chachamim, says, understand, it's not simple. You can't just blame the Chachamim as being mediocre, spineless, passive people who couldn't care less about human dignity. And because somebody invited them to a party, they're going to let this Rosh Hashanah embarrass somebody in public. You understand that this is not a simple situation. Some cipher, lovely, in a very interesting interpretation, analyzes the story. He says, let's think about this. We can assume quite logically that Bar Kamtsu was no Tzatzka. He was Gansa Fine Russia. How does the Chsam Soifa know this? I'll tell you how he knows this. You were thrown out of a party by Jews. It's not nice. It's disgusting. It feels horrible. Right? You may need therapy for 10, 20 years, and you should maybe charge the host for doing it. Granted. Why are you running to Rome? Why are you running, why are you running to Vespasian, to Nero? Why are you running to Turkomede? To Stalin? To Himmler? To, what are you running to these people? What are you running to Arafat, to Ahmadinejad, to Rawani, to Nasrallah? You have an issue, I got it. This guy was disgusting, he embarrassed you in public. So that's why you want millions of Jews to die? That's why you want Rome to destroy? What type of person is this? You see, what are, what are you dealing with? Who are you dealing with? So he says, V'yakideh <laughs> It was known when Chazal say, Yakiri Yerushalayim. Yakiri Yerushalayim means the precious Jews, the pious Jews of Yerushalayim would not sit by a Suda unless they knew intimately the person they were sitting with and what type of person he was, that he was a righteous person. So now understand the Bala Suda also. He knew who this guy was. It's not that he was his enemy because he owed him three and a half thousand dollars, he didn't pay him back for a job, and therefore he became a sworn enemy. No! This man was probably a Russian Marusha. He was an unscrupulous person. He was a rotten person. He was a sour person. Look what he did at the end. This doesn't happen in a vacuum. People get insulted. People get destroyed. They have a taina. You're running to Rome. How do you sit with a suda by this person? Which also explains what I started the shear with. If somebody offers you $80,000 to pay you for a meal, even if he's your enemy, take it, you fool. Not if he is a different type of enemy. He may have not been a personal enemy. He may have been an enemy in the sense, how could you befriend such a person? He's a lowlife. He's a, he's a mushkes. He's a metuv. He's a rush. He's a mushkes. He's a sickening person. Running to the Romans because he has a problem with the Jewish community. Zolzain, his accusations are true. What, they do, what they're doing is wrong, but it shows a character. You can't sit by a meal. So now he's going to buy his way off, out. He's going to bribe his way in. He's going to say, I'll pay you for the whole meal. I want to be accepted. I am not for sale. I'm not going to sell my people. I'm not going to sell my mother. I'm not going to sell my soul. I'm not going to sell my God. He throws him out. Some cipher says, analyze the story. I mean, I'm adding here some fluff, but analyze the story and you'll understand that there was a justification. In other words, you may even say it was the idealistic thing to do. It was the idealistic thing to do. It would have been easy not to throw him out. It would have been nice not to throw him out. But it was the right thing to do. You can't tolerate such a person here. Some people have to be thrown out. Some people have to be thrown out in public. Ah, you could ask him to leave privately. Sometimes maybe shame is not a bad thing in this situation. That's what the Chsam Soifer is saying. And now if he would have not let this guy go, if he would have let him stay, all the Chachamim would have to leave. Because they have to sit, they, people they sat with a Suda were people of sterling reputation. So they now have to leave the meal. So what is going to happen here? He's going to stay himself with Bakamsa. You understand what type of party it's going to, what a party it's going to look like. They say that Arizal, had a student, Reb Moshe Alshech. 
Reb Moshe Alshech wrote a commentary on Chumash. It's called Torah's Moshe, Chumash and Tanakh. It's an extraordinary, long, elaborate commentary by the Alshech lived in Svas in the 16th century. He would give a drosha speech, a Shir Shabbos afternoon, and from this he wrote up his commentary in the Alshech on Chumash and Tanakh. And it was a very popular drosha. He was a huge baldarsh. And once Darizal came, it was Parshas Chayisara, he was speaking about the first story of Ephraim, and Sora and Avram and Morris Amachbel, etc. In the middle of the Drasha, imagine the Arizal, who was his Rebbe, stands up and leaves. Now you can understand how, what that did to the Alshech. It took out all the Chayas from him. He finished, but he was already, he felt lifeless, he felt terrible rejection. He goes after that Arizal and he says, Why do you leave? He says, I'll tell you the truth, I'll tell you what happened. He says, you understand, when you give a drasha about Avram, who do you think comes? Avram Avinu came. And Sarah came. They all came to listen. Ephraim came. Whoever you spoke about, their souls came into the shear. In the middle, the shear was going very well. And I saw that you're starting to feel arrogant. And your arrogance was becoming bigger and bigger. And now Avram can't deal with arrogance, so he ran away. Sarah also ran away. Who stayed? Ephraim. I didn't want to remain alone with Ephraim, so I also left. Yeah. So Chamzayva says, the Chachamim would leave. They can't be at a meal with this person. So he would stay alone with this person. He had to make a choice. Whose leaves? The Chachamim or him? So he chased him out. So anybody who has a brain to analyze the story knows it's not a Chilul Hashem that he was throwing out. There's justification. At least there's another side. Other way of looking at it. Achreb Schaye ben Afkilas, Haye Savlin Godl. Schaye ben Afkilas was a very different type of person. He's a moide de Kasavlin, tremendously tolerant person. He was fine with every type of person at his table. Ah, you say this guy is despicable, I rush, I low life. Schayeb and Afkilas just had that quality to tolerate every type of person. For him, this would be a desecration of God's name to throw out a Jew publicly, whoever that person is. That's the view of Schayeb and Afkilas. We have this whole sugya of the argument in Bishami and Basilil, Upneya Yeshuasha. Comes the Pneya Yeshu and says the time of the Bishami of Basilil, the Bibunachim Allah Shulchan have a graf gedev shall rei al kain mutter lenair hatavla. The Pneya Yeshua says the argument of Basilil and Bishamai is not if you hold from Mukta or not. It's something else. There's a concept in Mukta called gedev shall rei. Gedev shall rei means a bottle of excrement. Geref is a flask, uh, you translate Geref, uh, a flask, a, ba a bottle, a barrel of rei. Rei is excrement, soya. The halacha by muktz is, if there's a Geref shorei, your child comes into the dining room middle of lunch and decides to do what he has to do, the one-year-old baby to do what he has to do, right in the dining room. What he leaves on the floor is not edible. So l'chayr, it's muktzah. Are you allowed to clean it up on Shabbos? The halacha is anything that is disgusting and abominable and detesting, people are allergic to it. There's no halacha of muktzah, meaning you could remove it. You don't need kalacha you don't have to do it in a bizarre way, in direct way. You could pick it up and move it. But this doesn't only mean excrement, it means anything disgusting. So for example, there's people who love uh, knacking semichkas on Shabbos. Uh, sunflower seeds, yeah? Yeah, papitas, they sit, and a whole Shabbos afternoon, they could sit for three and a half hours, and the knack that's called in Yiddish, knack and sandwich, because they open their, it's a whole avoid, they put it in their mouth, they taste it, they look, they lick, they, and this is how they analyze the world. So those who follow, of course, the Psakim of the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, know that in the city, he was very machmer, not to crack any nut on Shabbos, because boirer and muktza. He said it always, it often comes to boir and mukt, and therefore, if it's not cracked before Shabbos, you shouldn't crack. But halachically in Shulchan Aruch, you're allowed to crack a nut on Shabbos, it's not a problem. He himself says it in Shulchan Aruch, you're allowed to. 
So after two hours, when you come to the dining room table, you know what it looks like, yeah? It looks like the Tower of Bovel, made of sunflower seeds. Basically what it looks like. The guy sitting there has no problem. He's ready to go for another two hours. His wife, Zolzainz Gesund, walks into the dining room and she says, this is disgusting. Get rid of it. But now he's from, it's Muktzah. I can't touch it, it's Muktzah. It's not edible. All you have is shells. There's no nuts there. It's shells. This is a classic situation of Gedev Shorei. It's horrible, it's disgusting. You're allowed to get, it, get rid of it. Are you allowed to lechatchila make a Gedev Shorei so it shouldn't apply Muktzah? No. But if you have a Gedev Shorei, you're allowed to get rid of it. That's called Gedev Shorei, a bottle of excrement. So the Pnei Yeshua says, this is the heter of Basila. Basila holds of Muktzah. But he holds, it's disgusting. Bones and shells are disgusting. It makes people feel disrespect, disrespectful. It's had covered habrius. The Chazal relaxed the Isra of Muktzah. But the Yavid, if you have it already. And therefore, you're allowed to clean it up. Even Beis Shammai says, you can pick up the board and throw it out. Why does Reb Shaya ben Afkilis argue? He says, no. So the Chazam Soifer says, I'll tell you why. Because of his tolerance. Because of his savlanut, the type of person he was. Things didn't get to him like they get to other people. Some people have a short fuse, a short circuit. Zachariah ben Afkilis was a different type of person. He can have anything and anybody on his table. Just like he can have this Russia Marusha come to at his table. He can also have disgusting food at his table. Al Shulchana is an interesting, a very cute sushtal. On his table, everything goes. All types of fahakta foods, rotten foods, shells and husks and bones, and all types of people, rotten people also sit at his table. If so, im Cain, al Cain, asuloyle nair hatavla. He can't get, he, it's not a get of sharei, it's muktza, it's not edible. He's not allowed to move it. So he can also have bar So now Rabbi Yossi says, Ha, you're not going to get rid of the bones and the husk. Everything goes on your table. That another, that's savlanut. That's why Rashi says savlan. It's not humility. The patience, the excessive tolerance that you can tolerate piles of bones and shells on your table. Let me tell you, Chavra, that level of extreme tolerance destroyed the Beis Amikdash. Why? Because Abchayeb and Afkilis could not make peace with the sages expelling him from the, the sages allowing him to be expelled from the house. He felt it would be a tremendous Chilul Hashem that has to be avoided at all costs. The story has to may remain behind doors. And therefore they should not do anything with the carbon, not offer the sacrifice, not kill him, which would only create a ruckus and a commotion and a conversation of the Muzaris Bilavana, those that stand under the moon and want to understand the night owls who want to understand what happened analyzing all the news events. Let's keep it under the rugs and Pshayab and Afkilis therefore rejects the option of offering the animal on the Mizbeach or killing him and as a result of that Hechriva es Hechriva es Beiseinu it's interesting it's interesting when you look at the Gemara simply the literal interpretation is the Gemara of course does not exonerate Bar Kamtze from what he has done going to Rome but the Gemara also says Akamtze u Bar Kamtze Chorav Yerushalayim and Bar Kamtz and tells us the whole story and seems to indicate the fact that the, the, seems to indicate the truth that the fact that they did not protest was not something positive. So even though the Chsam Soifer here gives the justification for it, because this explains why they did not protest, at the end of the day, they are not exonerated for that, which tells us something very, very profound. That before you shame somebody in public, before you throw somebody out of shul, before you throw somebody out of your home, before you throw somebody out of your suda, even if you are doing it for idealistic purposes, and not only that, one day you will face heaven and say, I'm the only guy who's not for sale. <laughs> Everybody else here is for sale. Everybody in this world, you give them a couple of dollars, shh. They say there was once a rabbi who was having a din Two people. So somebody stuck under the table, he put in an envelope, 
and suddenly it started to gravitate towards his direction. The rabbi opens up the envelope later and he sees four and a half thousand dollars and that person won the court case. The opponent comes to the rabbi later and he says, listen, I know everybody needs money. I need money, he needs money, you need money. But you're considered a big, big, big rough. I didn't know that you would sell your soul for four and a half thousand dollars. A guy like you, I thought, at least a half million dollar. A hundred thousand dollar. Epis! Epis of mamoshes! Four and a half thousand dollars you sell your soul to Shoichet? Come on! Your price should be somewhat higher. He said in Yiddish, the Fakhoivs didn't shame for fair and a half thousand dollars. You sell your soul for one hand. Rob says, You don't understand. Ich hab schon verkauft meine Schamme 30 Jahre zurück für 5 Millionen Dollar. Jetzt ist alles Revach Naki. He says, I already sold my soul 30 years ago. Yeah. 5 million dollars. There was a court case. I got 5 million dollars. I sold my soul. Now everything is just profit. Now it's just interest. Another 4,000. Another, now it's just Revach Naki. So this guy comes, comes back, the, 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 the man, the host, we don't know his name, says, I'm the guy who doesn't take bribes. I'm the only real person around here. Everybody else is for sale. I see a guy, I tell him who he is, I throw him out of the house. He offers me a hundred grand. I say, not me. You could do this with other people, not me. That's the perspective, and it's a perspective. And it's a perspective that still exists in the Jewish world by certain individuals. They consider themselves kanoim, zealots, and they will not sell their God for anything, not even for human dignity. But here we see another perspective. Here we see a different perspective that we have to take into consideration. So this is the Chsam Soifer's view. Now, the Chsam Soifer is the Chsam Soifer. But I want to make one horror about this Chsam Soifer. And that is that the whole story of Kamtsa by Kamtsa. Before it went into Gemara, it went in first to Medrash Rabbah. Medrash Rabbah in Eicha, Eicha Rabbah, Parsha Dalet, Piske Gimel, has the whole story of Kamtsa Bar Kamtsa. With one detail that the Gemara emits, for whatever reason, a lot more details in the Medrash. The Medrash tells a whole story. And the Medrash also adds there that there was a, says there was a party, and the rabbis were sitting, and the man threw him out of the party, and he went to the Caesar... And he told the emperor of Rome that the Jews rebelled. And he sent him a sacrifice. But he said, send it to me with a messenger. Bring, not only me, bring somebody else who will testify. That the Gemara doesn't say. And he sends it with a messenger. So there's two people. So now he has to make a blemish that the other one shouldn't know that he blemished. So middle of the night he blemishes it in a way that the Gentiles don't know that it's a blemish. So the one who's traveling with him from the Roman emperor doesn't know he did anything. Because in the morning he looks at the calf, he doesn't see there's a blemish, only the Jews consider it a blemish. That's why he had to do it that way. And now what happens is they go and the whole story happens and the Chachamim want to offer it, but they don't offer it. They want to kill him, but they end up not killing him. And the messenger goes back to the Roman emperor. The Roman messenger, not the Jew, who says what happened. Which of course, which of course, puts into question the words of Rashi, that Scharia ben Afkilas tolerated the man that he didn't kill him. Even if they would have killed him, this man would have gone back to Rome and say, by the way, they killed the Jew. So it wouldn't have helped unless they would have killed this man too, which probably the emperor could find out about that. But there's one detail here I want to focus on in this medrash. Take a look. Eicha Rabbah, Parsha Dalet Piske Gimel. You see? You know who has, was at the party? V'hoya Sham, Reb ben Afkilas. He was at the party. V'hoya Sasipik biyade limchas, v'loy micha. He could have protested, but he didn't protest. The whole theory of the Chsam Soifer is contradicted by this Medrash. He was at the party. He is the one who was quiet. Chsam Soifer says he would have never been quiet because he could not tolerate throwing out a Jew from a party. He would have kept and made sure that this Jew stays 
Everybody could go on his table, but it turns out that the story happened with him according to the Medrash. And the Medrash continues, on Vasnusa Shrebschaya ben Afkila Sarfes Haechel. Which on Vasnusa? This one. That he did not say anything when the host threw him out. In the Medrash, it's not on Vasnusa of saying, don't kill him. That story at the end is not attributed to the Pschaya ben Afkilis. That's only in Gemara. In Medrash, the Pschaya ben Afkilis' name comes in as somebody sitting at the party and being quiet, and it's this humility that destroyed the Beis Hamikdash. So we have three stories about the Pschaya ben Afkilis in Shas, in Chazal. Number one in Gitin, he says, don't offer the animal and don't kill Bar Kamsa. Number two in Shabbos and Tosefta, don't touch the bones and the husks on the table. Number three in Medrash, he was at the party and he didn't say anything. That's another question. Why is that humility? Why is that called humility? Just like we asked, why is it called humility when you don't want to kill somebody? Why is that called humility? Why is it called humility when you don't want to offer a blemished animal? Good question. Why do we call it anvasnusa? But the whole idea of the Chsam Seifer, of course becomes deeply questionable when you see this medrash. So Pschayah ben Afkilis, his whole concern was the Chilol Hashem of the Talmud Chachamim, that they didn't protest, because he said, you have to protest, he is the one who didn't protest. So now, very briefly, <laughs> we're going to do three more views. The historical view. The straightforward view, the simple view. And finally, a spiritual Hasidic interpretation by the Marianayim. We now turn away from Jewish sources to a very different type of source. It's also a Jewish source, but it's a different type of source. It's called Yosifun, Josephus. The Wars of the Jews, Muhammad Sayyuhudim. As you know, Josephus Flavius was a Jew. His name was Yosef ben Matisio. He was a Kayan. He was part of the revolt against the Romans. He surrendered to the Romans. He acquiesced. He gave himself up. He found favor in the eyes of Vespasian. And he was taken in to the Romans. And he was a writer. He was a historian. So he is the one who chronicled Jewish history, including the history of Churban Bayesheni, the sources that we have for that story in detail, outside of our own sources among the Chazal, come from Josephus Yosifun. Yes, there's been long debates if the Romans altered the text, if the Christians altered the text, how reliable it is, but no question that the Svarim, the books of Yosifun, or Joseph, jo Joseph, Josephus Flavius, his last name he took, it's the name of Vespasian's family, Basically, to honor Vespasian, his own name, last name Flavius, was the name of Vespasian's family, to show kinship to the Romans. And he was obviously a very controversial figure, but his svarim are brought among the rabbis and the sages throughout all of the generations. In Melchama Yishayuhudim, the wars of the Jews, Dalet, Dalet, Aleph, I quote you, Josephus, Yosephus, Yosephus, Virashe Hakanoim Hoyu. The leaders of the zealots, the Kanoim, were the groups who decided were fighting against the Romans. There was a huge debate and war in Jerusalem. The Kanoim, the zealots, the Sikrikin decided war against Rome. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said, you won't succeed. We need to make compromises with Rome. They burned down the food in Yerushalayim to force the Jews into war. They forced the Jews into war. Rabbi Yechonah ben Zakkai sneaked out of Yerushalayim as a corpse because they wouldn't let any person leave Yerushalayim. They wanted there should be a fortress that the Jews would have to fight and then ended up in an absolute disaster. But this was a huge fight in Yerushalayim that happened, the Gemara describes in Gittin at length, the catastrophe. They're called the Kanoim. Rashi HaKanoim, who were the leaders? Ha'echad Elazar ben Shimon HaShemem al HaKanoim Ma'od Ke'o Yemas Kalim Tzietzeh B'Tachbulah V'Hevel Lamalei Achirei Tzaseh One was a man named Elazar ben Shimon he was very, very trustworthy by the zealots. He was brilliant and he f always knew how to get them to follow his advice. Hasheni, Scharia ben Ampiklus. Shneim and Mishpachis Koyanim. The second one is Scharia, and his father's name he puts here as 
ampiklus, which is not very different than afkilus. In fact, what does the word afkilus mean? Afkilus, I don't expect anybody here to know, but in ancient Greece, in Lashen Yavonis, in the ancient language of Greece, in Greek language, afkilus means humble. Noyach lebrios, somebody who's easy to get along with. Somebody who's easy to placate, easy to satiate, not a prima donna, not somebody who's always demanding and a chronic complainer. That's what Afkilus means in Greece. It's interesting, they keep on talking about his humility. His father, whose name was Afkilus, is it because his father's name was Afkilus that they apply this term to him? Or is it because this term was so close to him that they gave him this name Afkilus? But Afkilus means humility in Greek. Ampiklos means, Ampiklos is a very similar word in ancient Greek, which means somebody who's praised, somebody who's likable, somebody that people praise him from every angle. If it's the same person, we have here a whole different take on the story. Reb ben Ampiklos, Reb ben Afkilos believed that you have to fight against the Romans. Do not make peace with them. Don't take his offerings. Don't take his sacrifices. Fight him. Fight them. Let's get rid of them. They hate us. Great. We hate them too. Let's go to war. In fact, Josephus brings a story that the Roman emperor would send sacrifices regularly and the zealots rejected them. He, he doesn't say the name Schaia ben Afkilus, but he says the zealots rejected. And the other rabbis begged them, said, don't do this offer their animals and they said no we want to go to war so he sees this whole episode in Gemara as an outright confrontation between Jews can you interpret this in the Gemara itself it would be hard with the word anvasnusai. this doesn't seem like the word anvasnusai. but here I refer you to Rebbe Uven Margolius Rebbe Uven Margolius was one of the Goine Yerushalayim and in his interpretation on Gemara he says anvasnusai is a euphemism so you, it's a nice word, it means kapdonusai, the harshness of Subschaya ben Afkilis. He says, always look in Gemara, you'll see Anava and Kapdonus are always in contrast to each other. Anvisen and Kapdon, Anava is the humble one, and Kapdon is the harsh one, the fighter, the one who doesn't tolerate. So the Bruvim Margolius argues on Vasnusi as a euphemism. Where was the humility here? This was the Kapdonis. Rabbi Schaib ben Afkila says, I'm not budging. According to Josephus, is it possible it's the same person? And he basically was calling to war against the Romans. That would be a whole different twist, a whole different interpretation. And then you would have to know what Anova means. Is Anova a euphemism? In other words, it wasn't really Anova, it was the exact opposite. Or it means that he was a humble person and therefore they accepted his opinion, they accepted his, his, perspe his, uh, his perspective. So basically he was a very humble person, but deep down he had these convictions with Rome. And because he was so humble, so therefore people had a weakness to him, a sensitivity to him, and they embraced him. Perhaps, perhaps not, I put out that interpretation. I now come to the Maharitz Chiyus. Reb Tzvi Chiyus. Reb Tzvi Hirsch Chiyus is known as Maharetz Chiyus, is his commentary on Gemari Gittin. Now, as you know, he was a very, very interesting personality. He was born in the year, he passed away in the year uh, Tofresh Tezayin. That would be 1855. At the age of 50, he was born 1805. He passed away in 1855. He was a rabbi in uh, Kalish, in Poland. Before that, he was a rabbi in Zalkova, in the Ukraine, near Poland. And the Tzvi Hirshchius was from the Goini Hadar. In the Hasidic circle, some persecuted him because of his wide spectrum of knowledge, and he was close with certain people that they felt he shouldn't be close with. He was a tremendous god. Reb Tzvi Chiyos gives the following interpretation to all the Gemaras, which I would say seems to be straightforward, simple, and direct. Let's see. Zok de Marats Chiyos. I don't know where is the humility in not killing somebody or not offering an animal. Say his tzitkis, his righteousness, 
He's scared to deviate from halacha. We can't offer an animal. We can't kill somebody. His chassidus, he's very, very pious. Even in these situations, he will not deviate from halacha. What's an vasnusi? Where's the humility? Rashi knew the problem. Rashi says it's not humility, it's tolerance. But the truth is, he believes Anova is precise. This is about humility, not tolerance. You see, he says as follows. Ula. Halachically, there's no question you're allowed to sacrifice this animal because it put in danger. Klal Yisrael, pikuach nefesh, is doicha all halachas, including not to offer a blemished animal. Nowhere does it say in Chumash you have to rather die and not offer a blemished animal. It's a love, but this is a sakon. It's not a regular situation. You see that the Chazal criticized him. Rabbi Yochanan criticized him. That means they felt he behaved wrongly. They felt when you're dealing with fear of the regime, of the Roman emperor, you have to violate the and offer the animal. And the Maratzchius brings rayas from Shas. Interesting, Rai, is that this was the case. Yuma Samachtes, the Koyanim went out, the Koyan Gadol went out with his Bgodim, the Koyanim went out of the Beis Hamikdash with Big De Kohuna, with Shatnas to greet Alexander the Great. How? How are you greeting Alexander the Great wearing wool and linen, wearing Shatnas? You're not doing the avoid in the Beis Hamikdash, you go out with the Bgodim? The answer is, Ema Samalchus, it's dangerous. Whether you offer the animal or you kill him, you're doing the right thing. You offer the animal, you're allowed to because it's an issue of life and death of the Jewish people. Even if you can't offer the animal, you kill him, you're doing the right thing because he's a roidif. He's a murderer. He wants to kill the Jews. The problem is he was a humble person. And he was really a humble person. And because he was so humble, he didn't have the guts, the courage to be decisive and to take an extreme decision which is not conventional. Killing a person who made a blemish is unconventional. Offering a blemished animal is unconventional. He was afraid that people will say he didn't follow halacha. He felt too humble to feel that he has the right to make extreme, unconventional decisions. And say, this is what we have to do, even though in other situations it would be wrong. As Hairas Shah, this is the calling of the hour. Not that he knew that rabbis are not entitled to do this. Elio Anavi offered sacrifices outside of the Beis Hamikdash, but he felt, This is for the great people of every generation. I am not that person. Who am I to make a decision? Who am I to take a stand? And therefore, the right thing here is passivity. The Chazal chose that word very carefully. What's the word? He was a humble person. He was a pious person. He looked at himself in a very lowly fashion. I'm a simpleton. And therefore, even though he knew what might be the right thing, he lacked the conviction, the confidence, the chutzpah, the sense of pride, the sense of dignity to say this is what has to be done even though in other situations it would be wrong. And what happens that is, then is you're passive, things work out, but when you're a leader in a time of crisis, you can't be passive. You have to be proactive. And as a result of this, catastrophes happen and the Churban Beis Hamikdash occurs. If this is the case, I think the Toisefte Mesech Shabbos works perfectly. You might say, what does this have to do with bones, 
and husks and shells on a table on Shabbos. But the truth is that it conveys the message in a very powerful way. The entire moon is reflected in a single cup of water. The moon is larger than a cup of water, but the whole moon is reflected in a cup of water. The body has a hundred trillion cells, and each cell contains the DNA, the genetic program for the entire organism. Each cell. Each cell has everything. When the Chazal looked at behavior, opinions, we speak many times, there's two ways of interpreting Torah. One is a broken Torah and one is a whole Torah. A broken Torah means, Moshe breaks the luchas, each piece of Torah is self-contained. It's a shard. You don't see the puzzle. When you really learn Torah, each piece is a reflection of the entire mosaic, of the entire tapestry. They're learning about Hilchah Shabbos Muktza. It has nothing to do with Chorben Beis Hamikdash at the surface. Huh? It has nothing to do at the surface with Chorben Beis Hamikdash. But that's only if you don't see in every cell the full organism. If you don't see in the cup the entire moon. The nature of the human psyche can be seen not only in pivotal moments, but also in small encounters. The great personalities, personality characteristics of people, you don't only see when they're standing at forks and they have to make monumental decisions. In little tiny conversations, in small encounters, exchanges, disagreements, debates, behaviors, you could see everything. You just have to be able to know how to see. The biggest things are reflected in the smallest experiences, sometimes more than even big experience, because they're not so noticeable. And therefore, you're not so defensive when it comes to it. What do we see with the argument between Beishamai and Beishilal? Beishamai says, lift up the board, don't touch the bones. Beishilal says, it's fine, take the bones and throw them into the garbage. It's not that Rebbe ben Afkilas had a third opinion. Rebschaya ben Afkilis did not want to take a position. He didn't want to take a position. He said, I don't want to get involved in sticky situations. I'm humble. I'm going to be shamay, be silo, It's not for me. So what do you do? Uh, I'll figure it out. I'll spit it out from my mouth. It wasn't coming from a place of confidence, of strength. This is the halacha. They're both wrong. That's why the Gemara doesn't say, the Taisef doesn't say, Beishamai says this, Beishila says this, Chayi ben Afkila says this. No. He was just looking for a way out. How do I get out of this mess? I also want to eat on Shabbos. I'm looking for a way out. And he finds a way out. What do we see here? In life, you have to make decisions. Passivity is sometimes an option. But it's not always an option. And if you're a leader, passivity is lethal. In every generation, there are situations that come up that did not exist in previous generations. And sometimes you'll have leaders, rabbis, sages, chachamim, and they'll say, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to take a stand. All I could say is, let's leave it status quo. We survived three and a half thousand years. We'll survive another three and a half thousand years. This is what Rabbi Yochanan is criticizing. It's not coming because somebody who didn't care, who was uh, apathetic, who was rebellious, who was insensitive. No! It came from somebody who was sensitive, who was pious, who was humble, who was an authentic human being. But sometimes, humility... <laughs> Hello. Sometimes... Huh? Sometimes, humility is catastrophic. You know when? If there's somebody about to go to Rome and say Mardu Yehudai, if a Beis HaMikdash is going to be burnt, if Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, if the Jewish people are at stake, if somebody is getting away with murder, he's putting in danger thousands and thousands of Jewish children. He's putting in danger thousands and thousands of innocent people. Passivity is a crime. Humility is a crime. Insecurity is a crime. The lack of confidence, the lack of dignity, the lack of making a decision, this is the right thing. It may be disguised by fear of heaven. 
But Rabbi Yochanan couldn't say it better than Anvas Nusoi Hechiva. Remember, sometimes our children, our souls, our holiness gets destroyed not through arrogant people, but through humble people. Because when humility is misplaced, it becomes a form of arrogance. So from all the three situations, a pattern emerges. He's sitting at a party. Somebody was thrown out in public. Somebody was ashamed. Stand up and say something. No, 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 no. There's another perspective. This guy is a chashviyid. This guy is a rosha merusha. He threw him out in public. There's another perspective. What do you do? You do nothing. You do nothing. You start checking your tzitzis. Yeah, you start learning dafyoimi. You put the lettuce under the chandelier to start checking the lettuce. You get into a debate about tchelas, b'dikas tayloyim. You start speaking about the sheer hadas, b'chaim noach, chazaynish. There's plenty of good things Jews can do. You look the other way. In two minutes it'll be over, shh, nothing happened. Make sure nobody was with an iPhone with a video, because nobody's allowed to have iPhones over there, so it won't go on the internet. Weitengegangen. Not because he was a bad man, because he was a humble man. It's not so simple what's going on it. He's a chosh of a yid. He invited me. I know he invites to the party. He's a yid. He doesn't miss a shachis. Mit ha-minchim, mit ha-mayr, v'alayn gebor, degeit ha-mikveh, elek rabbeinu tam's tefillin. No. He embarrassed somebody in public. He snuffed the life of somebody. So, he meant it l'shem shamaya. He was humble. He was too humble to take a stand. Story number one. Story number two, bones, yeah, bones, no bones. I don't take positions. Who am I to take a position? I'm going to find a way out. With bones and shells, we don't care so much. Be machmer, isn't the eight? But the Yossi says, I want to show you something. He's a leader. And he couldn't take a position in Elche Shabbos. He couldn't take a position when it came to Klal Yisrael's destiny. He couldn't say, offer the animal, because you're not supposed to offer the animal. Kill the person, because we usually don't kill a person. He always wanted to play it safe. Safe with whom? Safe with God. Safe with Torah. Safe with mitzvahs. Safe with Shulchan Aruch. He wanted to be sensitive to everybody. He wanted to be morally perfect. He wanted to avoid tough decisions. He was always afraid of the risk of error and moral failure. He was afraid that somebody is going to say, Oh, Anaya God Lador is destroying Judaism. Who are you? But when you live in a space of leadership, and every person lives in a space of leadership with their own constituency, their own family, their own friends, their own disciples, their own community, that behavior becomes extremely reprehensible because in moments of crisis hoping that the problem will just go away on its own and we just do nothing we just let the status quo reign creates disaster we know in our generation in various situations and questions the natural way is to be humble it sounds like Jewish it sounds holy. You can't go wrong with being humble. You can't go wrong with being an anav. We learned before, Toyavas Hashem Kol Gvalev. Get rid of it. Be humble. It sounds great. Do what your father did, what your Zayda did, what your Elta Zayda did. But when Rome is coming to burn Yerushalayim and millions of souls are on the line, then humility is anything but noble anything but divine, anything but just. Now you have to be a Yehuda who gets up and says, Ki avdecha orav es hanar. You have to bound on the table, benafshay kshura benafshay, and say, I can't let the status quo happen. They say that there was a fellow who uh, has been hired as a new CEO of a large corporation. The current CEO was stepping down, and uh, he became his successor. And before he took over the job, the previous CEO said, let's have a private meeting. And at the meeting, he gives him over the reins, and he also hands him three numbered envelopes. One, two, three. He says, open these envelopes when you face a problem in the company that you can't solve. Good luck, and he leaves. Things were going along pretty smoothly for the first six months. 
After six months, the CEO began getting so much criticism, things were going down the drain. He realized there's nothing he can do. He opens the drawer, takes out envelope number one. He opens it up, there's a piece of paper. It says, blame your predecessor. Great. He pulls a press conference and he says, the previous CEO, as you know, was a crook. He was an idiot. He was a moron. He was a shlamazel, a shlamab, a shlamiel, a la yutzlechnik. And he blames all the woes of the company on him. And people understand. He says, but we're going to change it. Things pick up again and the company is going smooth again. A year later, again, he's experiencing a dip in sales. Some serious uh, malfunction in the products that he's producing. So what does he do? He opens a second envelope. Second envelope reads, now it's time to actually reorganize the company. Calls a press conference and he says, we made a few mistakes. We're restructuring, we're organizing, hiring, firing. Shite. Another year passes, it's been going smooth, but now it's really, he's facing bankruptcy. He opens up the third envelope and it reads, time to prepare three envelopes. So you understand, in life, you can't always prepare three envelopes and pass the envelopes. I want to tell you a story I saw. It happened in April 2003. It brought to life for me this story, this idea. A man named Aaron Ralston was climbing in Canyonlands National Park in southeastern Utah. An 800 pound boulder falls on him and pins his right arm. April 2003, Aaron Ralston in southeastern Utah. 800 pound boulder tries to get out the right arm with 800 pounds pinning it to rock it's really impossible he lay pinned for nearly four days before he runs out of water there's no water left he's pinned to the ground what does he do Aaron decides he needs to make a decision he needs to take action he's trapped if he remains that way, he faces certain death. There's not much longer he could survive without water, without nutrients, without food. What do you do? What do you do? You remain there, you die. You leave, you can't leave. So Aaron Ralston shows an option that made him, of course, an international sensation. If he would have been passive, if he would have just let things be, he would have died. But what is he supposed to do? No choice seems good, but you have to make a decision. And a decision he makes. But the problem is that every decision you make is problematic. But no decision is worse than everything. He pulled out his trustworthy pocket knife. He amputated his own arm from below the elbow. He wrapped a bandage around it, around the part of his arm that was left intact, and he climbed down to the floor of the canyon. He then hiked downstream, where he was spotted by Utah, Utah Police Safety, a Utah police, Utah police Safety helicopter. He was rushed to the hospital. Aaron survived. He wrote a detailed account of his experience. The book is entitled, between a rock and a hard place. I guess pun intended. I think this tells us something very profound. You have to learn how to make decisions in life and go with them. The problem is either decision is imperfect. If you offer a blemished animal, you're doing the wrong thing. If you're killing a person, you're doing the wrong thing. The problem is the alternative, not making a decision, is far more imperfect. It's called Chorben Yerushalayim, Chorben Beis HaMikdash. In fact, I once saw a response by Reb Moshe Feinstein, Igris Moshe, I think Yerid Deya Kofalov. Reb Moshe was Matir Anaguna. 
the whole story, a woman couldn't remarry, she wanted to remarry, she was stuck in an old marriage, it was a whole question, yes, no, Reb Moshe was mater. A rabbi wrote him a very sharp letter. How do you do such a type of thing? Why don't you leave the status quo? Let the status quo be. And he responded with this Gemara. And the interpretation of the Maharitz Chiyos. It wasn't tolerance. It was humility. It was a person like you saying, who are we to make decisions? And he says, listen, if a decision was made already and it was embraced by the Poiskim, I don't argue, I can't argue with it. If I know there's a precedent for it, I'm not going to try to make, come up with a new decision. But in a situation where somebody's life is on the line, and if I don't make a decision, this person's life is going to be destroyed in one way or another, woe unto me if I believe that the Torah is locked up and has to remain rigid, and there's no room for creativity, for ingenuity, for development, according to the Kalalim, according, of course, to the principles of halacha. A beautiful, practical way in which he applied this to contemporary halacha. And now we come to the last interpretation. Whatever you'll see immediately, a very different perspective. This is from the Moira Nayim. It's on your first page, the second to the last source. The Moira Nayim was written by Reb Menachem Nochem of Chernobyl. Reb Menachem Nochem Tversky. Reb Nochem Chernobyl, who was a student of the Baal Shem Tev and a student of the Maggid of Mizrich, passed away at Aleph Cheshven Tovkuf Nun Ches, 1797, the same year like the Vilna Gon, whom we spoke about and mentioned earlier. But came, of course, from a very different world, from the world of the Baal Shem Tev, the world of Chassidus. Says the Moire Nayim, Avart. After everything said and done, you'll agree with me, there's something off. Let's say you're a Shariah ben Afkilis, you're, Shari ben Afkilis. you're a sage, you're a rabbi. A guy went to Rome, told the emperor that the Jews want to fight you. And this is not a question of how much Donald Trump loves Jews when his daughter converted to Judaism, his son-in-law celebrates Shabbos, so in America Jews can argue about these things. This is Rome 2,000 years ago. And when the Roman here is the Roman emperor, the Jews rebelled. And he's bringing a carbon to prove that they rebelled or didn't rebel. Ultimately, how could anybody say, don't offer the carbon? You're humble. You don't want to take a position. You're humble. You tolerate. Chilol Hashem. Good. Alts good and fine. It's mamish pikuach nefesh. It doesn't seem to be such a complicated situation. It's real pikuach nefesh. Millions of Jews' life are at stake. Just say, offer the animal. You don't want to kill him, don't kill him. Bring the carbon. Tell the Roman emperor we offer the carbon. This is missing at the end of the day. The Moire Nayim gives a new perspective. And of course, characteristically, he gets in more to a spiritual dimension of the story. F. Shalaymar. He begins just like the Vilna Gon. If they listened to him, it means he was the greatest. If not, they would have said, Pschaya, you're a good man, but please. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. We need peace with Rome. The fact that they listened to him and they were ready to surrender their own position, means they looked at the Pscharia as Godel Bedoyer, as the greatest of his generation. To the sense, to the point that they said, he is the man to listen to. Ekveis Besser. Vigam Tzrich. So this is which makes the question bigger. How could somebody say this? And how can everybody disagree? How can everybody agree? The answer is, they had to agree, because it was him. When you have a person of that stature saying this, everybody says, you know what? As we learned before, Sanhedrin Lamed Vav There's no choice. You have to listen to him. But how does he say such a thing? Vigam 
כי אין זה פעולה לבטל הגזירה שנגזירה שיחריב בייס המקדש, כמו שידע זוי ברוח הקודש. ואם לא כן, האיך לא יחוש לזה דב זכריה, גם כן שיקריבו משום שלוי מלכוס, האין לך דובר שעומד בפני פיקוח נפש, וכל שכן שכל נפש יצלו יהיו בסכנה, על ידי שלא יקריבו, אך בבדי מטעם עומר, על ידי שרו, שכבר נגזיר אגזיר, שבבדי יחורב, ועל כן לא ירוצו שיבוטל דובר אחד מהתור. והילה כמו ירנאים says, זכריה בן אפקילוס had spiritual insight, divine inspiration. And he saw that the time of exile has arrived. The Beis HaMikdash is going to be destroyed. Jewish history is changing. And there's nothing we can do to change that. Making sure that this animal goes on the altar, that helps him be tight the bunkers. Killing this guy, you think you're saving something. It's the time of the Chorban. It's not going to happen this way. It's going to happen that way. This is just where it's going. This is where history is going. This detail, that detail won't alter it. So the Pschayim and Afkila says, at least let's hold on to the Torah. What's going to make us survive is the Torah. Let's not change halacha. Let's not change halacha. Let a Jew know that you don't offer a Balmum to the Mizbeach. It's a halacha. Don't touch halacha. At least let's hold on to that. If I could save the Beis HaMikdash, I would change halacha. Pikuach nefesh is doicha kol kula. You can deviate almost every mitzvah, from every mitzvah, to save a Jewish life, never mind all of Klai Yisrael. Rabbi Pscharia doesn't know this. Pscharia doesn't know you could be makriv, a blemished animal, to save Klai Yisrael. Of course he does. But he says it's not going to save anybody. <laughs> How can I violate Shabbos? How can I eat treif to save a life? I'm not saving, the guy is dead. You're not going to be Mechal Shabbos, sorry. To save, you could be Mechal Shabbos. To save a life. Not to, not, to, not to make yourself feel good. There's nothing we can do. He saw things that other people didn't see. He saw it's a time, it's a moment. He was right. A little time. So therefore, he says, at least, let's hold on to Torah. Let's not touch Torah. This is the ultimate weapon of the Jewish people. The ultimate ammunition of the Jewish people. This is how they will survive and come back one day with Torah. This will hold them. This will connect them to eternity. Don't touch it. Even if he offers the animal, he changes, he's mavatl the din, and he says it's fine because pikuach nefesh, it's the time of the churban, it's going to happen anyway, so why should I change halach? This is how the Moirei Naim justifies his position. He saw what others didn't see. Vim kein tzarech lahavin. Lama loyama lahem. Kach befeidish. Why didn't he tell this to them? Explain to them your position. Say, listen, Rabbi Sai, do not Rabbi Sai, I would love to offer the sacrifice and make peace with Rome and make sure that we're safe and Pikuach Nefesh overrides Halacha and therefore I can offer it. But let me tell you, we're not going to accomplish anything. This is going to be ineffective. We're just going to be obliterating words of Torah in vain. It's going to be futile. Tell it to them. Let them appreciate where you're coming from. They would turn to him and say, how do you know? How do you know? Abschayim and Afkilis was not ready to get up and say, I have some prophetic powers. I have some powers of Ruach HaKodesh, of holy divine inspiration. He was humble. That's what it means that his humility destroyed the Beis HaMikdash. Wait one second. Why? You're saying that it wasn't his humility. It would have been destroyed anyway. No. Here comes the Moirei Naim's word. If not for his humility, he would have told us what he sees. He would have said, I see that the Beis HaMikdash is going to be destroyed, and that's why I tell you, don't 
let this man bring the carbon. Because it won't be effective. The Gzaira was already. He would have said it. And you know what would have happened? And the Chachamim would have known there's no such a thing. Hope is lost. They would have done everything they can to alter the decree in terms of prayer, in terms of tshuva. But because of his humility, he didn't want to say that he sees this with divine inspiration. So he didn't tell anybody what he was thinking. So what did he say? You can't offer the animal because people are going to think that if you offer an animal that's a balmum, they're going to think you're allowed to offer a balmum. And you can't kill him because people are going to think if you kill somebody who made a blemish, you're allowed to kill somebody who made a blemish that warrants a death penalty. That's what he said. Really what he was thinking was, this is the halacha, why should you change it? There's going to be a churban beis hamikdash. He was just giving the external explanation, but not the internal explanation. What was he thinking? He was thinking sefafalan. He was humble to say what he saw, and he thought, there's nothing to do, so that's why, why should we change halacha? What was the tragedy here? The tragedy here, the Marianayim says, there's no such a thing that something can't be changed. There's no such a thing that this is how it is, and it can't be altered. The Beis Hamikdash is being destroyed, and therefore nothing can happen. No! Don't think like that. They could have found ways. They could have created revolutions in heaven. They could have altered reality. A Jew can change reality. And therefore we say it's his humility that Echriva is Beiseinu. The humility in thinking of himself that he can't speak about himself that he saw heaven. Which also has to do with a different type of humility that what? We can't change reality. And therefore, Echriva is Beiseinu. Had he would have said the Beis Hamikdash is going to be destroyed, forget about it. They would have said, no, the Beis Hamikdash won't be destroyed. We will fight it. We will alter the decree. And then, of course, they might have also offered the animal in order to be Hateva, not to create a new fight with Rome. So this is similar to what Rebbe Yitzhak Baditsheva writes in Kedusha Slevi Parshas Noyach. It says that Noyach came into the ark because of the flood. So Rashi brings from the Medrash, Af Noyach, Miktane, Amonohoyo. Noyach too had little amun, he had little faith. He didn't go into the Teva until the marble was coming down. Ask the commentators, Noyach had little faith. He built an ark for 120 years. The world mocked him and he built an ark for 120 years. That's called little faith. Hashem speaks to him directly. It's called little. He didn't even have to have a muna. Hashem spoke to Noyach. He didn't even need faith. He spoke to Hashem. And I believe Yitzhak of Baditshev says, Af Noyach Miktane Amonem Hoya means not that he had little faith in God. Miktane Amonem Hoya means Noyach had little faith in himself. He had little emunah in himself. Hashem said there's going to be a marble. He said, okay, what's next? Build an ark. Okay, what's next? Go into the ark. Okay. He said, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu the same thing. I'm going to destroy the Jewish people. Moshe said, not on my body. Not on my dead body. If you don't forgive them, erase me from the Sefer Torah. Mecheni is the letters, May Noyach, the waters of Noyach. Because Moshe was a nitzu, it's a spark of Noyach. And he rectified Noyach's mistake. Noyach underestimated the power of a human being. To alter reality, the power of tefillah, the power of davening, to shake up the heavens. Noyach underestimated his own koyach of tzaddik goyzev, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mekayim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Goyzev, tzaddik mevatel, as the Gemara says. It's not he didn't believe in Hashem, he didn't believe in himself. He didn't believe that he had the power to alter things. This is the way it has to be, this is how it was, this is how it's going to be forever. That's Ketane Amon. And Vasnusr Shrab Shaya bin Afkila says the Mayra Nayim. He wouldn't say that he saw things in Ruach HaKaidish. So therefore they didn't know what he was thinking. They didn't know what he was thinking. They listened to him. But this is the Akhrivas Bat Mikmik Shaina. Not because the man went back to Rome, but because they didn't know to confront the reality and try to change it. Have a wonderful week. This class is brought to you by the Yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.